Okay, so this afternoon we've got two lessons, back to back, with maybe a small decompression in between, uh, but we won't leave our seats. Uh, Rachel is going to... Rachel is going to teach us about uh, weak lensing, shear estimation, and systematics, and then Mike is going to teach us about null tests. Okay, so thanks, Rachel. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, do you hear me okay? Oh, now the microphone's on. Okay. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be uh, giving this lesson. As you can see, I use the time-honored trick of giving an excessively broad title because I couldn't decide exactly what I wanted to talk about at the time that I had to give a title. So this title could easily be several dark energy schools worth of material. Um, and I'm actually going to talk about uh, some interesting subsets of that material uh, in a way that I hope will connect nicely to what Mike is going to talk about next. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief background about weak lensing followed by four short sections. One is, what's the meaning of a galaxy shape? Uh, how do weak lensers measure galaxy shapes? And then sections on two specific sources of systematics. And if we're running low on time, we might skip one of those, depending. OK, so weak lensing. Um, what is weak lensing? Well, first I'm going to start by just reminding you what gravitational lensing is, deflection of light by mass. So in this particular picture, we have a very, which is strongly lensing a quasar and giving two images. So that's strong lensing. And the thing that we like about this is that it's sensitive to all the matter, all the gravitational matter in that lens system, not just the visible matter, but the dark matter. And you already heard all about strong lensing this morning. Okay, so weak lensing. What is weak lensing? Well, if we go back to this picture, we see that you know part of the issue here is there's light coming from something almost directly behind this lens object. Okay, but if we think of lensing as being due to some distortion of space-time and, and the paths that in that space-time, it doesn't seem obvious that only things directly behind should be affected by this mass. You could imagine an object which really lives up there, it's emitting light rays, and those are getting deflected. Maybe they're getting deflected a bit less. The, the ones that we see are getting deflected a bit less because they haven't passed as, as close to that lens system. But it seems like there should be some effect. Okay. So weak lensing is what happens when these lensing deflections are smaller. They don't result in multiple. Sorry, can you pull this cord? Pull. I just, no, it's just so tall in here. Thank you. OK. <laughs> um, when, um, lost my train of thought. When <laughs> the, the deflections are not uh, as strong and there are not multiple images, but light rays are still de deflected and they result in a number of different uh, changes in the apparent images. It, number of changes in the images of objects. Their positions are changed, their fluxes, sizes, shapes. The particular thing that uh, we, weak lensers, often like to measure is uh, the change in shapes. So in this picture, this is us down here. We're looking up at this object that has a kind of smeary shape here. The light actually came from this more circular object. <clears throat> The light rays were deflected by this lens system. And in particular, light rays at you know, different points on this object were deflected slightly differently. So we got something that is kind of smeared out. And the amount of this smearing or shearing, we call it, depends on the amount of mass here and the, the separation on the sky um, between the lens and the light ray and the distance between us, the, the lens, and the source. So what does this look like? If we were so fortunate as to have a set of idealized circular background objects randomly distributed on the sky and ask what would, that, what would this field of sources look like if we plopped a bunch of lenses between you know, us, the observers, and this screen, we would get some smeary patterns uh, here, which 
people who are used to measuring lensing can, can easily pick out where there might be lensing masses. For example, here where I'm pointing the laser, there must have been a mass in front of here, and that's why there's this like circular kind of smearing pattern around it. Uh, and there is presumably something here, and so there's a lot of smearing around here. If you see radial smearing, that is some kind of underdensity. Okay, so the key thing is that there are these coherent patterns in the shape distributions of the galaxies. So, um, of course, this is an idealized example, and funny thing you might noticed at some point is that galaxies aren't actually round. Okay, so the things that are being lensed in real life are not round. They aren't ellipses either. They have lots of interesting structure to them. Still, we measure the shapes of these galaxies where we'll talk about how to define a shape shortly. And what we're doing is we're, we're looking for coherent patterns in those shapes underneath the otherwise random um, intrinsic shapes. Okay, so they're, they, we, we model their intrinsic shapes as being random on the sky, and then anything that pops out above that is a coherent shape correlation uh, we model as being due to lensing. Um, <clears throat> and so measuring galaxy shapes is sort of the name of the game. Okay, so the model here is assume galaxy shape intrinsic component, intrinsic, and then we assume that the measured shape is going to be something like the intrinsic shape plus the shear. There, there's a twiddle there because shears don't exactly add that way, but for our purposes, this is close enough. So if we imagine taking the measured shapes, these E's, and me measuring their shape correlation on the sky, so we define a correlation function. This is the, the shape correlation as a function of separation theta for pairs of galaxy shapes. We can then you know, take our, our definition, the measured shape is the intrinsic one plus shear, and we get four correlation terms out of it, correlations of E intrinsics with each other, the intrinsic shapes with the shear, and the shear with the shear. So the last term, the one that's in a box, shear correlations, are what we can predict from cosmology. This is the lensing shear due to the distribution in the universe. It's the thing we care about. The other terms are going to go away in the limit that galaxy shapes are isotropically distributed. So in other words, galaxies, you know, they have some coherent, they have some, sorry, random ellipticities. They're not oriented systematically with respect to each other. And they're not oriented systematically with respect to the shear. And so these other terms are going to go away. And it's the cosmological term that we're measuring. And you could imagine all kinds of funny things that break what I just said and make these terms not vanish. And indeed, weak lensers in practice do have to worry about those terms not vanishing. But just conceptually, um, this is what we're trying to do. Other stuff also happens to galaxy shapes um, beyond shearing. So over here is some idealized galaxy image at perfectly high resolution that we will never, ever see. The light rays propagate through the universe, and there's some shearing effect. Then the light has to go through the Earth's atmosphere for a ground-based telescope, and for telescope optics for any telescope, whether it's on the ground or in space. And as a result, there's a convolution with a blurring kernel called the PSF, the point spread function. So at the top is an image of a star that essentially is a direct tracer of the PSF. At the bottom is this now blurred galaxy image. And then we have the realization on the detector, which gives us this pixelated image. So there's a convolution with a pixel response function. And there's noise in a realistic image. And not shown on here, but relevant for projects like LSST, the fact that there can be some effects introduced into the images. Um, you do non-ideal behavior in the detector as well. So there's all this kind of other stuff happening. Weak lensers really care about this very first step. So we have to entangle the coherent shearing pattern from this PSF convolution and detector effects, which also introduce coherent shape distortions. And we have to do it for galaxies with finite resolution 
and signal to noise ratio. So, tricky. On the stream. So you want me to shut this? Uh, it matters not. Sorry. Oh. I'm just kind of speaking to the computer. Okay. <laughs> you want to record it? Okay. Fine. So. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I just said the name of the game is measuring galaxy shapes and measuring their coherent, uh, you know, their correlated shape distortion. So what, what, what is a galaxy shape? What does that mean? So that's what I thought we'd talk about next. So let's talk about a really idealized situation. We have a galaxy. There is no PSF at all. No detector effects. Infinite signal to noise. And it's a galaxy that, funnily enough, looks just like an ellipse. Okay, so uh, we have a coordinate system, coordinate system x1 and x2 um, that it happens to be aligned with, and we want to measure its shape. You could think of this as just not being a pixelated image, or you could think of it as being an image with really tiny pixels that we're going to sum over. So the natural thing to want to do is measure the moments of this image. So there's the zeroth moment of the image that's just the integral of this light profile over the entire image. That gives you the total flux. That's one number. Okay, that's not what we care about. That's not the shape, okay, but that's an interesting quantity related to the galaxy. Then if we want to measure its shape, it kind of stands to reason we probably have to know where this object lives. Where is it on my image? Um, I happen to have put my coordinate axes right at its center, but okay, that's assuming prior knowledge of the center. We need to measure centers, so a way to measure the center would be to integrate the light profile times these coordinates. That's going to give us effectively the average value of x1 and x2 over the light profile, which in this image would give us exactly you know, this position. That's the centroid. So now we're moving onwards and upwards. We want to get towards the shape. So the second moments of the light profile tell us something about the shape and size. So shape and size together is, you can think of that as being three numbers. If you have an ellipse, you can define an overall size, like an overall scale for the ellipse, an axis ratio, and a position angle. So that's three numbers. We can measure those from the second moments. So that's, again, the integral of this light profile times the coordinates minus the centroid. Right? We're measuring the, uh, with respect to the centroid position. Uh, so if we consider what this equation is doing, if we had a perfectly circular uh, Gaussian, so like a circular 2D Gaussian function with some sigma, the 1, 1, and 2, 2 moments would be sigma squared, and the 1, 2, moments would be, would be zero. So we can imagine measuring the moments of this perfect thing um, in a very simple way and using that to quantify the shape and size. And again, it's the shape that we want to use for weak lensing. But there's a problem. And you can think about this if you, if you imagine adding noise to this image. So you can think of the noise field as being added to the idealized light profile. So we now have an idealized light, light profile, this I of x1, x2, plus a noise field, where the noise field values are drawn from some, uh, are random deviates drawn from some distribution, Gaussian or Poisson, with some standard deviation. So it turns out if you do this moments estimation, in some image that has a galaxy at the center with low signal to noise, and there's you know, noise in every pixel, these moments diverge, because you're adding over an awful lot of pixels that are just dominated by that noise. And you can write down you know, the expected signal to noise of these moments, and it's very bad. This is not a practical way to estimate shapes in the presence of noise. Um, so anybody have any thoughts on a solution? to this problem? Say it louder. Waiting. <clears throat> Waiting. OK. So the problem, again, is that you know, there's an awful lot of pixels in, 
if you imagine some big image that has this in it, there are an awful lot of pixels that don't really have information about the light profile of the object, and they just have noise. So you could imagine defining weighted moments where you do some kind of weighting by something like the light profile to, to emphasize the pixels that actually have information and to downweight the ones that don't. So you choose a weight function that's somewhat matched to the light profile. And you, every single one of those integrals I gave you before defining the moments, you just stick the weight function uh, into those integrals. So there are some examples you, you could imagine. You could imagine doing a crude you know, guesstimate of the size and then just make a circular Gaussian with that sigma. There are also something that are commonly used called adaptive moments. Adaptive moments are essentially uh, effectively an elliptical Gaussian fit to the object. So you could imagine doing, um, doing a moments estimate. It's going to be noisy. You use that to define an, ellipt an elliptical Gaussian. Then you remeasure the moments with that elliptical Gaussian, get an answer out, use that as the next for another round as your weight function, and iterate over and over until you're getting out what you put in. Uh, and that is a way to iteratively estimate the best fit elliptical Gaussian. And that will help, this will help get better um, signal to noise in the moments measurements. OK, but so imagine now we have some weight function that we're going to use, or some way of choosing a weight function per object. And we're going to use that and say, we're going to use the moments, and we're going to try to measure a galaxy shape. But so far, we've just been talking about our ellipse, our galaxy that was an ellipse, maybe with or without noise. Now let's talk about this guy. This is a perfectly reasonable galaxy. You know, most galaxies don't look exactly like ellipses. So this perfectly reasonable galaxy. Now we're going to imagine choosing a weight function and measuring the moments and defining a shape for this thing. And you could do a mental exercise and think, what would happen if I chose my weight to emphasize the very center versus this sort of intermediate part of the light profile versus the very outer parts? And ask the question, what is the, um, what is the shape defined for this object, defined in that way for this object mean? How will it depend on the signal to noise ratio? You could imagine adding noise so that you can't even really you know, make out the outer parts of the light profile. Maybe you can only make out the inner parts. So um, just to pose this as a question for you guys to think about and discuss with each other for like a minute or two, uh, you know, what do you think is going to happen as you change the weight function from really small to really big as you measure this galaxy, or if you change the signal to noise um, when you're doing this measurement? So. Talk amongst yourselves.
happen. Um, I think it's, um, I'm glad you're all into this, but I think it's time to start soliciting um, some answers. So anybody want to comment on this one? Nobody likes my questions. <laughs> Everybody was talking. Right, so you, you hit on two of the key concepts that I was hoping you would hit on. One is that the magnitude of the ellipticity that you measure, just the overall magnitude, how round versus elliptical it is, will depend on, on whether you're emphasizing the inner parts or the outer parts. And there's also some kind of twisting effect, isophotal twisting effect, right? So the position angle you might assign it also appears to change. Um, Anybody else have any thoughts they want to offer on this one? Aha, uh -huh. okay. That's a good point. That is absolutely true. If you, so we see that there are some color gradients in this galaxy from the inner part to the outer part. And so if you, for example, were to measure this in a blue photometric band versus a red one, you would be emphasizing different parts of the light profile that have different shapes. That is a very good point. Okay, I, I see what you were driving at, and, and that's an interesting point. So I, I don't know if everybody could hear, so just to repeat a little bit, the, the weight function, the, the, the ellipticity you measure would depend on the weight function, and so one could imagine using that as a way to classify how easy it is to measure a galaxy shape or not. If, if the answer you get depends a lot on your weight function, maybe, maybe that, that, that is worrisome. Okay, so you all pointed out really relevant aspects of this problem. Um, and at some level, the answer to this question, if, 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 if I were to say to you, well, with, with this weight function, what's the shape of the galaxy? If you had said one answer and then another people said, well, another person said, but I like this other weight function, I think the shape of the galaxy is that. The answer is you're both right and it's okay. The answer for, now, somebody who is worried about galaxy morphology won't say this, but as a weak lenser, I'm very happy to say that the shape of a galaxy is not even necessarily a well-defined concept. That at some point, weak lensers have to make a completely arbitrary decision about how we're measuring the shapes, and that's okay. Different people with different measure measurement methods are gonna get different answers for the same galaxies, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as they both know how their shape measurement that they've defined responds to a weak lensing shear. The ultimate question is when you measure the shear using the ensemble, do you get the right answer? And nothing else about your completely arbitrary shape definition really matters. So, um, so that's the point that I was hoping to convey here, because I think uh, it's very easy when, especially when you're starting out in the field, like I started in grad school working in weak lensing and I spent two years creating and validating a catalog of galaxy shapes for weak lensing and it's very easy to start thinking, well I work on shape measurement, I work on shape measurement, but I don't actually care about shapes. I care about inference of the cosmological lensing shear, that's all I should care about, and shapes are just an intermediate and, and fairly arbitrary step on the way there. So, 
there are some, one sec, there are some, there's one practical implication, say p two people have two different methods with different weight functions, and they say, oh, well, I want to compare our methods. We should compare our, ga our shapes for every single galaxy. Don't do that. <laughs> They're going to be different. You're going to fall down a rabbit hole of worrying about differences that might not actually matter because your inferred lensing shears might be the same. And that's what you should compare. Yeah? Uh, well, as long as you understand what the response to the shear is for that weighting, then you're fine. What matters is that you define the, sh the, the shapes in a certain way and you understand how that definition responds to shear. So different methods will respond in a different way, but you just know, you have to know what it is. Another way to ask the same question, I think, would not there be uh, an optimum weight function to be as most sensitive to the shear? Would there be an optimal weight function that's most, that's most sensitive to the shear? Um, that's, yeah, I mean, so, I, that, that was my, right, he said, whatever gives you the optimal signal to noise. So actually, is it definitely the case that the, the optimal signal noise on the shape might not be the optimal signal noise on the shear for the ensemble, right? Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if everybody heard. The question was, does a different weight function give you different sensitivity to systematics? And in general, yes, that is the case. So for example, uh, the PSF you know, kills off certain scales. You know, it, it kills off like s smaller scale modes. And so if you, you focus on those, then you're focusing on scales that have been more blurred out by the PSF, and you have to correct for that more carefully. Or if you're measuring something from the very outer isophote, like if you have a weight function that emphasizes the, the, the outer parts of the light profile, then you might be more sensitive to well, issues due to finite signal to noise or due to sky subtraction because the outer isophotes of the light profile are more affected by whether you got the sky right. There are all kinds of ways in which the, the effective weight function can affect systematics. Well, yeah, so, so just, just to be clear, this, this idea of the weight function, in some places it's put in implicitly, like in moments methods. In others, like model fitting methods, it's sort of implicitly there. Um, and, and often the right thing to do is something like filtering by the light profile itself, which of course depends precisely on the, the size of the object. Between the PSF and what? Sorry. Weak function. The weak, weak function. Um, it, right. Yeah. Is there any correlation between the PSF and the weight function that you should use? So, I mean, often the, the often the light profile or some approximation of it itself is used as the weight function, and the light, meaning the the PSF can involve light profile. So, so then, yeah, it, it's connected to what the PSF is doing. Okay, so next I was going to go into how do weak lensers estimate shapes. Um, so this could actually be like an entire dark energy school day plus some. So I had put uh, a reference, I, I had put some references on the dark energy school page and I'll put up my slides. This has some more references. I'm actually, going to go through this briefly just to give you a sense of the variety of methods and then I'm going to just talk specifically about how one class of methods work as a way to introduce you to how systematics can come into this. So um, 
I am immodestly suggesting that you look at the Great Three Results paper because it happens to summarize um, many different methods. There were 23 different groups that participated in this community challenge, and the results paper has to say something about all of those methods. So it's kind of a convenient place to look and get a sense for the methods that were actively being used in 2015. Um, not all active groups participated, but this gives you a, a sense of it. Um, so in that challenge, eight of the methods involved measuring moments of the galaxy light profile and moments of the PSF and trying to correct the galaxy moments for the PSF in some way. Seven of the methods involved um, fitting a model to the galaxy light profile. So trying to, to, to essentially say, here's what the galaxy intrinsic light profile looks like. I will convolve it with a PSF, compare it to the image, and optimize the galaxy model parameters. Generally, maximum likelihood fitting, um, although there's one partly Bayesian method um, in the mix as well. There were three machine learning based methods in the challenge and that represented a substantial increase over several years before so I expect that such methods may continue to be developed. There were also a few methods that had completely different philosophies from what I just told you. So what I told you is you measure galaxy shapes and you average them to get the shear. Um, but there are starting to be some methods that sort of um, push back on this and try to frame the problem differently. Um, so there is, um, there is a model in the challenge, uh, sorry, a method in the challenge, Bernstein and, and Armstrong method, which in, doesn't Im involve measuring per galaxy shapes at all. There are per galaxy measurements, but they are combined to produce an ensemble shear estimate. Um, there is a method of Bayesian hierarchical inference by Schneider et al. And there's a method called metacalibration, which involves directly calibrating the shear estimate uh, through operations on the images themselves. It was also used in the challenge and described there, although the papers just came out last week. So there's a pretty broad variety of methods uh, currently in use. And I'm just going to talk with you a little bit about the idea behind uh, what I called model fitting. So as I said, the idea is to build up some idea for what the galaxy light profile looks like. You, can, you generally have to choose a family of models. Cersic profiles are popular because galaxies that are not very irregular tend to look somewhat like a Cersic profile. Another option is to decompose it into uh, some basis function. Pick your favorite basis fu functions. You then need to know something about the PSF. For now, we're assuming the PSF is perfectly known, so you have an image of the PSF. And you use maximum likelihood fitting to optimize the parameters of your model um, to match the image. So your galaxy model might have some parameter that says you know, its size and its shape, and you have a centroid and a flux and some other structural parameters, and you're jointly fitting for all of those uh, and, and you know, marginalizing over the things you don't care about to get the shape. Yeah? Um, not, I mean, I'm mentioning it because this is something that was actively explored in the field for some time, and there are some <laughs> methods that involve doing that, like shapelets. You could do that if you think that none of the models out there match galaxy light profiles. Shapelets don't either very well. So um, that kind of rules them out. But I'm just mentioning it as an example of something that is sometimes done in the field. So as an example, I just wanted to show you um, how, how some of this can work in practice, starting from an image um, from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is an I-band image of a galaxy and, and just showing you how some model fitting can work. And I just realized I'm, I keep saying Cersic profile and I didn't tell you what a Cersic profile looks like. So I'm going to just write it on the board. Um, so a Cersic profile. If I'm just going to write a circular Cersic profile. So there's some normalization and then there's a uh, 
it. E to the minus R to the one over N. So if N is a half, this is E to the minus R squared. It's a Gaussian. Most galaxies don't look like a Gaussian. Uh, disk galaxies can commonly be represented as an exponential profile, e to the minus r, so n equals 1. And elliptical galaxies, early type galaxies, generally have n around 4 de Vaucouler's profiles. So they, the n values can span a range. And so that's one of the parameters you would be optimizing for if you're, if you're fitting this model. You'd be optimizing for the source n, the size, a shape, which I didn't build in because this is circular, a centroid, which again, you, this R is measured from, from the center, so the centroid is sort of built into here, and a total flux. So a CERSIC would have seven parameters um, if you account for the fact that you know, the centroid is two parameters and the shape is two parameters. So this object in the HSTI band, if we fit it to a CERSIC profile, looks like the top right. And you can see, you know, it gets the basic overall features, the shape right. But, you know, this galaxy appears to have some kind of, you know, brighter central bulge, and it can't quite accommodate that within this light profile. So the bottom is a fit to a bulge plus disk. It's a two-component fit where we assume there's one component that has n equals 1. That's more like a disk. One that has n equals 4. So that's like the central bulge. And they can have different shapes and centroids and sizes and whatever. So you end up with 12 parameters in the end. And you can see that does a little bit of a better job. You have that central bulge thing. To give you another example, this one, you can see this is a galaxy that looks like it shouldn't be, shouldn't quite be fit by a simple model. It has some, you know, there's like a thing going up here and a thing going down there. It, it, it doesn't look like an ellipse, right? So if you try, you can fit it to an ellipse. OK, it made a diagonal thingy like that. I mean, it's, it's not great. It shouldn't be great because that profile, that, that light profile doesn't look like it should be fit by a single thing. If you fit it to a two-component model, you can see that in the inner bit, it's hard to see on here. It's easier to see on my screen. In the inner part, the shape is more pointing that way, and the outer part is more pointing up and down, which is kind of like this light profile. So it tried to pick up some of the complexity. But you know, it's still not that great. And, and again, at some level, we don't, we don't care as long as we understand how the shape of the model we fit responds to a shear. OK. so. What could possibly go wrong with trying to fit galaxy shapes by, um, by picking a family of models like CERSIC profiles? So maybe you guys could uh, try to brainstorm for a couple minutes. Uh, again, you can talk to each other, whatever.
Um, I see some of you are still talking, but some of some of you have died, some of the conversations died down. So, anybody have any thoughts? What could go wrong? I totally can't hear you at all. Sure, the, there are detector non-idealities, and if you haven't corrected for them in this mo before you do the model fit, then you're gonna get the wrong model. That's, that's correct, yes. So there, it sounded like there were a few issues in there. There's blending, but also just galaxies that are, have morphologies that don't fit your model. Is that a correct yeah. summary? Of Okay, so that's two issues. One of that, so blending is a different issue, but even just when, when if you have um, galaxies that are not properly fit by your models and that gives you a bias in your shear estimates, weak, weak lenses call that model bias. Yeah. So yeah, so that if, you, if your star galaxy separation is not, not correct and you try to do this to stars and stars are not sheared, then you, yeah, that, that is a problem. I guess you already said, but uh, some kind of isotope, you are, uh, maybe if you run different uh, time exposure of the same galaxy, you will not measure the same, uh, the same uh, shape. Yeah, so if your model doesn't fit your galaxies, then, then, then what you fit what you get out of your model fit will depend on the observing conditions. Okay, I don't know if you guys heard noise bias. Yep, and I'm actually gonna define that on the next slide, so I'm not gonna talk about any more about what that is right now. Right, so actually there are a few issues in there. So I don't know if you guys heard, again, I'll, I'll just repeat. The number of model parameters you're trying to fit, if you're trying to fit like a two component model with 12 parameters, you know, so that could get very noisy. It's actually also a contributor to the noise bias, which again, I'm gonna talk about next. So um, you're right, that is an issue. Yep, if your PSF model is, is, is wrong, and you're using it as an input into this fitting process, then you will infer the wrong galaxy model parameters and that can bias your shear. <laughs> well, so, so Mike, actually, you might like um, answer nearly everything. Actually, that's why I like this question because I knew that no matter what any of you said, I wouldn't have to tell you you were wrong. <laughs> Nearly everything can go wrong. So um, actually a bunch of the things, I think we covered nearly everything on here. So you could have bad inputs. Your PSF model being wrong, that will give you the wrong galaxy model parameters. If you haven't corrected for detector effects in the image you put in, then again, you're gonna do something wrong. Um, the next one, well, selection biases, we're gonna talk about more in a bit, so I won't talk about that here. There can be errors due to the limitations of maximum likelihood fitting. Um, like, if you try to do maximum likelihood fits, you can get this effect called noise bias, which I will illustrate on the next slide. Or maybe your model is wrong. Um, and there are more, many, many, more, many, many, many more. Um, so, see some of the additional references I put up. So just to give you an example of noise bias, um, this is a plot from Refugia et al. 2012. So that was a paper which is about this issue called noise bias. So um, the basic idea here is that the presence of noise in the images modifies the shape of the likelihood surface. 
And so if you do a maximum likelihood fit, you're looking for the maximum of this likelihood surface, but it's in the wrong place uh, because of the noise. So this gives an example. If you have just a, a 2D uh, Gaussian, and this is a plot for the likelihood function for the size of that 2D Gaussian. And so you can see the, the really tall, narrowly peaked one um, that is for high signal to noise. And you can see it's centered on this vertical dashed line, which is the true input value. But then if you look at these likelihood functions that are getting like less and less peaked, broader and broader, you can see this very last one, for example, this is fairly low signal to noise. You can see that it's not just broad, but it's peaked at the wrong place. It's sort of 20% off from the true value. So if you look for the maximum likelihood point, then you're going to end up getting something which is systematically biased. So um, that's something which is often not intuitive to people. People think noise, that means there will be scatter. But in this case, because of this, this whole nonlinear fitting process we're doing, noise is giving us a bias. Um, <clears throat> and this is something which is kind of an unavoidable feature of maximum likelihood fitting. It gets worse if you have more model parameters. So for a while, people thought, oh, if I just get a better galaxy model, eventually I'll get one where I can do maximum likelihood fitting, fitting and, and have it be completely unbiased. But given the origin of this particular bias, that it's noise in the light profile changing the likelihood surface, uh, it makes the search for a perfect galaxy model not, not entirely something that, that, that makes sense. And instead, you have to understand and correct for this noise some other way. So I just wanted to briefly mention the way weak lensers tend to think about systematic errors, uh, some of the language we tend to use. So multiplicative bias. Uh, in other words, again, I should have put the equation in the slides, but so we have a shear estimate, which I'm calling g hat. Can you guys over there see this? No? If I do it higher up and bigger? Oh, yeah. I'm going to write it down here and raise the board. Thank you. Can you guys see, see this okay? That is a good point. I should have done it over there. <laughs> Additional bonus. Okay, so the estimated shear differs from the true shear by some multiplicative factor m. That's a multiplicative bias. Ideally, we want m to be equal to zero. And an additive factor here, where this number might actually depend on things like PSF ellipticity. So multiplicative biases, these M factors, tend to def depend on the galaxy and PSF properties. They're not just like a single number for all objects, for all methods. Um, you can easily divide your galaxy sample and try to identify relative multiplicative biases. But it's very hard, just from the data alone, to detect an overall absolute multiplicative bias. And so that's uh, one reason why weak lensers like simulations, where we know what lensing shear we put in. That's the, sort of the easiest way to, to find multiplicative biases. The additive biases can often be detected by cross correlations with something else. Um, <clears throat> uh, they can cancel out in certain cross correlations. They also depend on the galaxy and PSF properties. Um, but I just wanted to introduce this language because especially when we're thinking about future surveys that want to have this multiplicative bias M be smaller than, you know, 10 to the minus 3. 10 to the minus 3 is pretty small. We have to convince ourselves that we can, uh, that we can really reduce it that low and, and have a believable demonstration of that. So um, I thought we'd talk about PSF model errors. Um, well, actually, 
So we have two things left, and I think we really mostly just have time for one. So I'm going to go very briefly through this and just mention it. Uh, and Mike is going to go into it a little more in his talk, maybe. Um, so this is just reproducing what I said before about how model fitting works, that we're fitting the observed light profile to the convolution of a galaxy model and the PSF. Uh, so if we get the PSF model wrong, we're going to infer the wrong galaxy model. So I wanted to give you just some idea, some kind of intuition for what the PSF is doing. Because there are two main effects um, that PSFs have on the galaxy light profiles. One is that overall PSFs tend to be pretty round compared to galaxies. Um, and so that convolution with a round-ish thing tends to make the galaxies appear more round. However, PSFs are not perfectly round. They have a little bit of ellipticity. And PSF, the PSF tends to, you know, it changes as a function of position slowly. So if there's some PSF ellipticity at, at one point, it'll have the same, you know, a similar ellipticity at other points nearby. So it can imprint a small coherent anisotropy on the, the, the galaxy shapes uh, that looks like a lensing signal. So just to illustrate the rounding effect, I went back to one of the Cosmos galaxies that I showed you before. So this is the galaxy, and here is its PSF in Cosmos. Um, the image sizes are the same in every single panel, so you can compare them with each other. Um, uh, comparing them with each other is a fair comparison. So you see in this case, the PSF is pretty small compared to the galaxy. It's reasonably well resolved. So then I just started artificially smearing it with some bigger PSF and to show you what that would look like. So the bottom row is all the PSFs, the original one, and then the bigger one, and the even bigger one that I gave it. And the top shows the galaxy. You can see that we're smoothing out some of the small scale detail. We're making it appear bigger because it's convolved with this you know, large blurring kernel. But you can also see that you know, it looks rounder than it did before. Before it looked like a nice, pretty narrow ellipse. Now it's gotten fatter, so it appears rounder. And so this can give you a sense for what happens to shear estimates if you misestimate the PSF. Uh, just to take an extreme example, let's say the PSF, the real PSF is this one over here. Right, so we know, because you've seen all these images, we know the galaxy is actually really flattened. It just appears round-ish because of that PSF. So we have to, in our heads, correct the shape by a large correction factor because of this rounding effect. But let's say we got the PSF super wrong. We thought it was really small. We thought it was this one on the left. Well, this PSF is so small, you don't have to correct the shape much. So you think, it's just a fat, kind of roundish galaxy. It's not flattened. And you would th so you would think the galaxy shapes were much rounder than they actually were if the PSF was this and you thought it was this. We don't tend to screw up PSF modeling that <laughs> egregiously, but we, this is just to give you an idea of the overall impact of PSF model size errors is to introduce some kind of, um, going back to this model, some kind of multiplicative bias. Um, well, so it's getting smeared. So basically, I took the Cosmos image and I just I'm smearing it out, so the the it tends to smooth out the noise. In in a real image, if the PSF was bigger, that happens before you add noise, and, and so you'd still see noise. But I just did the most naive thing. So that's all I'm going to say about PSFs. We're not going to go into this in detail. Um, but oh yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, that, uh, that the question was about the impact of co-addition on, on shape measurement. So it depends a bit on how you combine the information in the different images, whether you co-add first and then measure, or you do a simultaneous fit. Um, so 
Oh, yeah, the answer depends on exactly how you do it. Um, so I don't want to get too much into that because we're running low on time. Um, I did want to say the DES Your Catalog paper has a nice, um, some nice derivations or how certain types of PSF modeling errors propagate into shear estimates. Um, and you're going to hear from Mike about null tests. So selection bias. This is my favorite underappreciated weak lensing systematic. Um, it is very important. It's important at the level that current surveys and even past surveys like SDSS had to worry about. Um, but people don't seem to talk about it that much. So first I should tell you what is selection bias. So we're going to assume we select galaxies based on some property that on this slide I've called Y. Right? You have to decide what objects to put into your sample. So you could imagine having a cut on flux or a cut on signal to noise or a cut on size or, or all of the above plus some more. All of those are cuts on some property. So a selection bias can occur when the observed value of Y for galaxies depends on the applied shear. If you have galaxies that are brought into your sample because they were sheared and that causes you to include them, then um, that gives rise to a selection bias. Okay, so you, you could imagine, for example, if galaxies that are aligned with the shear because of your selection, galaxies that are aligned with the shear are brought into the sample, galaxies that are perpendicular to it are not, you've created a population of galaxies that is only there because they align with the shear. And that violates one of those basic uh, assumptions from the very beginning that the intrinsic shapes in the shear are not correlated in some way. Or if the observed value of this property depends on the PSF ellipticity direction, maybe you always select things that align with the PSF ellipticity, so that creates a different kind of coherent uh, correlation across your field. So selection biases effectively are cutting on some property that correlates with the shear or the PSF direction and, and violates, leads to a violation of the assumption that, that intrinsic shapes are isotropically distributed. So we're going to have, um, this is the last thing we're going to do, five minutes brainstorming um, what kind of ways you could imagine you know, selecting a galaxy sample and could they cause a selection bias. <laughs>
Okay, everyone, let's uh, let's start collecting some answers. Well, but the question is, would the shear make them appear more red? That That's how you get a selection bias. So, I didn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. All right, so I was just thinking about magnification effects. That may have some galaxies passing the threshold and so on. Um, it's, so, uh, I certainly think of it as, uh, I think of it as something that one has to think about. Sorry, I don't know if everybody heard. Magnification effects bringing things over the flux threshold. Yes. Could your star galaxy separation bias you against small round galaxies? Do you specify the star? So, right, now the question is, so, if this is going to cause some kind of correlation with the shear, like if, so imagine if you have something which is pretty small and it's correlated, if it's aligned with the shear, the shear makes it appear more elongated. And if it's aligned against the shear, the shear makes it appear rounder. So if your star galaxy separator, you know, biases you against small round things, then it could potentially correlate with the shear and therefore give you a selection bias. Yep. Well, that's a slightly different issue. If it causes you to select your objects in a way that you don't understand the redshift distribution, then that would give you what we think of as a bias due to the, the redshifts. But it's not precisely the same as a selection bias, where the, the thing you're measuring is being tricked by the shear in some way. That is an issue, it's just a different issue. Yeah, so could I maybe generalize that to masking in general as being a potential contributor to selection effects? So if your masking has some coherent pattern, then that could, so for example, say if you have, um, yes, <laughs> that's one with which I have much painful experience in my life. Um, yeah, so imagine you have bad columns and you have a galaxy nearby which is aligned with the column so its light profile doesn't overlap much and you select it and you want to use it but one which is perpendicular so it's sticking into the bad column you would throw it out that makes you choose things coherently aligned with the bad column and it gives you a coherent shear effect which is purely due to selection so masking whether due to bright stars or, or other things can be a cause of selection effects So you're saying if you impose a cut on surface brightness? Well, so surface brightness is conserved in lensing, but this actually, if I could, if I could separate that out into something having to do with measuring fluxes and sizes and things like that. So a tricky thing is that in principle, it sounds like our ways of measuring, say, size or flux shouldn't depend on shear. In practical situations, they often do. And so anything having to do with either fluxes or sizes, you have to check, you know, am I measuring this in a way that correlates with the shear? And even if you think you're safe, you may not be, and you have to check. So yeah, that's also. Okay. When it comes down to my point, I think that any kind of selection is Well done. <laughs> any kind of selection is a problem. Um, yes, so, um, so my answer has a lot of things in it. Um, having to do with signal-to-noise, magnitude. 
size. If your flux measurements are affected, then photo Z cuts could also be related. Um, blending, local density, masking, all of these in principle could give you selection effects. In some cases, it depends on the exact detail of how you implemented the cut or how you measured the property that you're cutting on. But you have to kind of suspect all of these unless somebody shows you otherwise. Um, so there's some ways to, to estimate the magnitudes of these. You can, using simulations is typically the best way. It lets you estimate um, you know, how much your assumption of uncorrelated shears and intrinsic shapes is violated. Um, or you could just estimate how much is your parameter Y that you're cutting on depend on the shear. Um, but to give you a sense, typical magnitude of selection effects are a few percent. So that's far above LSST statistical floor. It's above the statistical floor for current surveys. We have to care about this. So that's why this is my favorite underappreciated uh, systematic. And I'm two minutes over, so I'm going to just conclude with the four uh, takeaway lessons. One is that weak lenses will arbitrarily define the galaxy shape. It doesn't really mean anything. We just care about how its ensemble average responds to shear. So um, galaxy formation, people won't like me saying this, but for our purposes, galaxy shapes are not themselves very meaningful. They're just uh, a means to an end. Um, most methods of inferring the shear have some intrinsic limitations. I gave you the example of noise bias. That's a basic mathematical limitation of maximum likelihood fitting. Other methods have other intrinsic limitations that we have to account for. PSF model errors can cause all kinds of subtle shear estimation biases, and selection bias is really important. And um, I will stop there. <laughs>